coach. He's been here since 2015. He has a distinguished career in coaching. His uh, bio is uh, uh, fairly impressive. He's a three-time national coach of the year, two-time national champion head coach, and this is his 31st season as a, a collegiate head coach. What I liked most out of his bio is he calls himself a team builder. So please join me in welcoming Coach Bob Nielsen. Uh, thanks, I appreciate it. Uh, first of all, if I knew you had this elaborate uh, uh, video uh, system, I would have brought some game tape. I know Susan would have appreciated that <laughs> to, uh, to be able to critique. And then the other thing, between the sports book and 50-50 raffle, Rotary is changing, I, uh, uh, sounds like. So, um, no, it's great to be here. Uh, just a couple of things uh, that I'll talk about today. First of all, uh, obviously talk about the season uh, and our team. Uh, but then I'd, I'd like to close talking about uh, some of the issues that are going on in college athletics right now, which I'm sure you might have some questions on as well. As, as Kevin said, I've been doing this for a long time, and certainly college athletics is uh, in a very unique space uh, right now, particularly uh, college football. Um, really excited about this year's team, um, and hopefully a number of you got to the game uh, last Saturday. Um, I love our schedule with the fact that we get to be home again uh, this weekend and uh, then we go uh, on the road and we get uh, back for two more home games. So uh, out of our first six games, we've got four of those at home and an opportunity to, to really build some momentum at the first part of the season. Uh, two weeks ago, we opened our schedule at the University of Missouri, um, a tough opening opponent uh, out of the Southeast Conference. Uh, um, played well at times, not well enough to, to be in the game at the end, even though I thought our guys really competed well and uh, made a little run there in the third and fourth quarter to, to close the gap. Um, you know, those, uh, those teams uh, at that level now have really begun to separate themselves from the rest of college football, and some of the things I'll talk about a little bit later will kind of give you an idea of, of why. Uh, and then we got a chance to come home yesterday, or uh, last uh, Saturday, rather, uh, against uh, University of St. Thomas uh, from uh, the Twin Cities, who has just recently made the transition uh, to Division I. This is their third full year in, in Division I. Uh, they are already competing against all the rest of our teams in the, in the Summit League, and you've probably seen them on the the basketball court or uh, volleyball or in some of the other uh, Olympic sports that you may follow. Um, they've done a good job with that transition um, and as a result have, have built a pretty competitive football uh, team. Uh, I thought our team played very, very well defensively uh, to shut out an opponent in college football in today's day and age of offenses is pretty unique. We hadn't done it since uh, 2019. Uh, and so a 24 to nothing win, even though we've got some growing to do yet offensively, was a good win and something that we can build forward uh, from a momentum standpoint onto uh, this week. Uh, this week we play uh, Lamar University out of Beaumont, Texas. Uh, they're an FCS school out of the Southland Conference, uh, which is made up of primarily schools from the state of Texas and Louisiana. Uh, you'll recognize that conference because we've played multiple teams out of that league, uh, both in the national playoffs and in the regular season. And I think you're going to see uh, teams from the Missouri Valley Conference playing teams out of that league uh, uh, more and more uh, as we move into the future with scheduling, uh, as that league is, is one of the leagues that are uh, not afraid to travel to the Midwest and, and has uh, uh, open dates at the front end of their schedule. And, um, they, uh, they come in uh, with a new coach um, who's uh, in the process of uh, trying to build that program uh, um, to, uh, uh, to be a contender in the Southland Conference. That conference is known for wide open offenses and uh, you're going to see quite a different offensive football team in them than you did uh, against St. Thomas that was very much try to shorten the game and run the football. Uh, this team's going to throw it uh, with balance and uh, be a different challenge uh, for us uh, defensively. Um, a few, uh, few players uh, uh, to keep your eye on uh, as the season progresses. Um, 
and I'll start on the defensive side because that's the uh, um, you know the most experienced side of of our football team. Uh, our two inside linebackers and and two of our uh, six co-captains, uh, Brock Mogensen and and Stephen Hillis, um, uh, both uh, return as uh, all first team all conference players, which is pretty unique to have two first team all conference returners at the same position. They both play inside linebackers. Um, outstanding players, uh, tremendous uh, representatives of the university. They're both right at 4.0 students, both uh, in the process of completing uh, graduate degrees uh, here and, and uh, two young men that have had outstanding careers and we need them to play uh, exceptionally well for us. Um, we also have an All-American, uh, preseason All-American defensive back in Miles Harden. Um, you know, Miles is a guy that uh, we want to try to keep healthy for uh, a full year. He's, he's played part of the last two seasons. Uh, he's had injuries that have kept him out of the second half of both of those years, um, but is recognized as one of the top uh, defensive backs in our level of, of college football. Uh, you saw a young man by the, the name of Nick Gaze have an outstanding game. Uh, last week, he was the National Player of the Year uh, in uh, FCS football, um, who's from Northwest Iowa. Uh, Nick, uh, the kind of guy that can have games uh, like that for us uh, uh, all season long and, and uh, another of the real uh, standout players for us on the, on the defensive side of the, of the ball. Uh, on the offensive side, and this is the area that uh, um, you know, as we look to this week, uh, we need to keep stepping forward uh, and show some improvement. Uh, we've been inconsistent uh, offensively in terms of our ability to, to move the football and particularly in regard to being able to put points on the board. Uh, our uh, uh, new offensive coordinator, Josh Davis, has done a great job of coming in, implementing a system. Uh, we're still going through a, a little of what I'd call growing pains there at the same time. Uh, it is a unit that's going to get better uh, every week uh, and uh, we'll find that balance between running the football and, and throwing the football, which we need to, to be successful uh, as we head into uh, the teeth of our schedule here uh, after Lamar heading into the Missouri Valley Conference. Uh, the conference is going to be tough again. Uh, right now we have the number one and number two ranked uh, teams in the country uh, in our conference in South Dakota State and North Dakota State and uh, we have four others that are ranked in the top 25. Uh, so six of the top 25 uh, schools in the country right now are in our league and uh, we have a couple of others that are receiving votes to be in the top 25 and, and uh, that's the way the Missouri Valley Conference is in football. You're going to play a nationally ranked team every week and uh, we certainly feel that we're a team that's got a chance to to uh, be competitive uh, through the course of the year and be in the thick of things uh, at the, the very end. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned that uh, I was going to talk about some of the things that are going on in, in college football and um, I'll do that right now and the first is conference realignment. Uh, if you haven't been following it, um, all of this is being driven by money and the, the television agreements that the major conferences have been able to secure. Uh, you've got leagues like the Big Ten right now that are uh, paying about $100 million per school per year on television contracts. Um, and so as a result, schools are moving to position themselves in those conferences where they can generate a greater income. And so what was the Power Five conferences uh, is now the power four because one of the conferences, the, the Pac-12, uh, as of a year from now, will have completely fallen apart. Um, most recently, you saw uh, Stanford and the uh, uh, University of California, uh, who were in the Pacific 12, are now in the Atlantic Coast Conference, uh, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but. Uh, um, those, uh, those leagues now have grown to anywhere from 16 to 20 members. And uh, I think that's the future of, uh, of true high-level Division I athletics, is you're going to have these four super conferences 
that are literally going to do things the way that they want to do them, and, uh, and the NCAA will have a minimal role in governance uh, of those programs moving forward. Now, obviously, it's a, it's a big deal for football. Um, I think as they're looking at it now, they're starting to say, well, what about all the other sports? And so you got a cross-country team that's traveling from Palo Alto, California to, uh, um, to Boston and back and forth. And unlike football and basketball that are chartering flights, they're flying commercial and you know doing those kinds of things. So there's going to be some some real hardships there that will eventually be addressed, but uh, the amount of money that's involved is, is driving all of those decisions right now. Um, the other thing that's impacting uh, a, you know, football as well as uh, uh, basketball and other Division I sports uh, is the issues related to uh, uh, NIL, uh, name, image, and likeness money. And, uh, and how that affects uh, the new rules regarding uh, the transfer portal and the ability to transfer freely among schools. Uh, where name, image, and likeness, the way that was set up by the NCAA was to provide student athletes an opportunity to uh, generate some income of their own, uh, whether it's through providing private lessons, helping with camps, uh, doing endorsement deals, and what it's become is it's become a way for uh, major institutions with large uh, fundraising bases uh, to form collectives where they are literally directly paying student athletes. And, um, and, and as a result, uh, with a free ability to transfer, student athletes are looking at opportunities to position themselves. Um, I, uh, I've heard this, that the name, image, and likeness money is some cases where you have college athletes now making more than uh, athletes uh, in the NFL um, through NIL contracts. And so it has changed the landscape. And so you have um, you know, the ability to um, go out and, and recruit a whole new team uh, through the transfer portal. Um, and uh, uh, use uh, resources through name, image, and likeness money to be able to, to uh, compensate uh, those uh, players accordingly. Is that a good thing? Uh, I certainly don't think it's the way that we intended college athletics to be, um, but it's here. And uh, until, um, you know, right now, we've, uh, they've, the NCAA has asked the federal government to get involved. Uh, to try to put some parameters on name, image, and likeness. And I'll tell you how far it's going is, uh, and I'm sure you didn't follow this, but we played Missouri two weeks ago. The Monday we played Missouri, the state of Missouri passed legislation that will allow the University of, money, of Missouri to pay NLI money, or I shouldn't say pay, but uh, that any student athlete that commits, a, a Missouri student athlete that commits to the University of Missouri will be allowed to receive NLI money upon their commitment. Not upon enrollment, upon commitment. And uh, so it's no wonder that the week before that, Missouri just got a commitment from the number three prospect in the country for the class of 24, <laughs> uh, who happened to be uh, a resident of uh, one of the North Kansas City suburbs on the Missouri side of the state. So um, now you've got other states wanting to very quickly pass the same kind of legislation uh, to, uh, to allow them and not allow one state to get ahead. So I think eventually there's going to have to be a way that it gets corralled, that it gets um, uh, in, in some way or form um, regulated, but we're a long ways from that right now. Um, at our level, I get asked this all the time, at our level, have you really started to see it yet? Uh, and the answer is no, uh, with the exception that at our level, we start to see some of the, the really top players at our level opting to go into the transfer portal because they have an opportunity to generate uh, uh, income through name, image, and likeness at other schools. Um, 
I think you're going to start to see it. I know North Dakota State has just in initiated their own collective, uh, as have a couple of other of the schools that are in our conference, um, to be able to provide additional uh, resources to uh, uh, their student athletes in primarily what's going to be uh, football and basketball. Um, so it's, it's coming. Um, how, how quickly it comes and to the extent that it comes at our level, uh, I can't answer that. It's certainly not going to be to the same level that we're seeing it at the, you know, the major uh, state universities right now. Um, so you add that into the mix of all the things you have to do as a coach. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting time for sure. And over my, you know, 31 years as a head coach, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, and uh, I, I, I still think, um, you know, the way to do it and the way that we're going to try to do it here is continue to recruit freshmen, uh, develop them through their four-year experience uh, while they're getting a great education. And hopefully that model will hold true as we move down, uh, move uh, on to the future. Uh, with that, I'll stop. If you've got questions about this year's team, if you've got questions about some of the things that are happening, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer those. Yeah? How does the transfer portal affect USC football? Yeah, good question. Uh, we had, uh, I want to say, seven or eight uh, of our student athletes opt into the transfer portal. Uh, not all of them were scholarship athletes. Some were walk-ons that decided to transfer to a different level of college football to see if they could play a little bit more. Uh, but we did have a couple of scholarship athletes that opted to go to different places, some because they wanted to see if they could find a starting role, some because they wanted to try to play at a higher level. Um, we did add about the same number of transfers uh, to our program. Um, and it's not going to be an avoidable, it, it's, it, it's not, you can't avoid it. it you, if, if you lose upper class, players to the transfer portal, you're really going to have to look at using the transfer portal to replace those upper class players. Otherwise, you're always going to be a team that's playing with freshmen and sophomores uh, because of the fact that you're going to lose some every year. So what you want to stay away from is, you know, the and it's working. I'm not going to say it's not working, but you don't want to be a Colorado, I don't think, and, and literally have 75 new transfers every year, which is the way that they've built that roster there. And I think it's a way that you can generate a good team. I'm not sure it's a way you can generate a good program. Other questions? Yep. What do you said that 80% of winning is recruiting? So how would you characterize and are recruiting the past seven years? I'm not, yeah, I think 80% might be a little high. <laughs> Um, uh, if, you know, if you asked me what, what percentage you thought, you know, recruiting, I think uh, there's still a lot of the percentage and development of, of student athletes and, and uh, uh, but you have to recruit well. Uh, I think our recruiting has been solid. I look at last year's class um, and I look through that group of, we have roughly 27 counting scholarship and walk on. I think we have 27 freshmen. And uh, I look at that group and I think, you know, we're going to be 60 to 70 percent of those guys that are going to be impact players for us at some point in time during their career, just based on my early analysis of those uh, young men. Um, you know, we've, uh, um, we've tried to stay in a regional basis as our priority in recruiting, um, regional meaning you know, the, the Midwest uh, area from Kansas, Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, Dakotas, uh, and, and Nebraska. Um, but we do go outside of that. Uh, we've we've uh, uh, been able to uh, find uh, um, a lot of uh, talented young men from the state of Florida, and we've built some strong connections there in our program, and, and, uh, um, uh, and then, you know, scattered around through that. So... We say, we're really not recruiting nationally. Most of outside of those areas that I mentioned, we're recruiting based on contacts. Uh, we just don't have the staff resources to be able to truly do that. But I do think there's enough talent in those areas that you can 
you can definitely build a championship team. Mm -hmm. So um, regionally, D1s are in larger communities. I mean, we're half the size of yeah. the other D1 school in the state, and either of us are a lot smaller than a lot of the D1s in the region. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit, or talk to us a little bit, if you would, if you have any thoughts on community size and how that impacts yeah. not only your ability to recruit, but, you know, yeah. engagement and so on. There's, you know, for, uh, there's some student athletes that the size of the community is not necessarily what they're looking for. And so, um, you know, what we try to, to build on is the, the, the fact that, you know, educationally and, and uh, opportunity wise, um, those things overcome a big shopping mall and maybe some of the additional entertainment opportunities that larger, uh, communities have and and uh, um, and so is that a negative I think every place has positives and negatives and and so you know for us we want to emphasize the positive things and find those guys that uh, the small community appeals to um, as a part of the recruiting process yep Yeah, it's something that we're educating our guys about all the time uh, right now. Um, and, you know, honestly, I didn't think uh, when the state of Iowa passed the legalization of, of sports betting, um, I guess you, you don't immediately think, wow, this is going to be an issue with college athletes. But as a result of that door being open to the general public and, and college students in general, um, you, you're, you're seeing issues with it. Um, you know, it dramatically impacted uh, Iowa State's program and the University of Iowa's program. The NCAA is very specific on uh, the fact that uh, uh, betting on any NCAA sanctioned sports is going to be penalized. And so what we've done, we've done more over the last two years really making sure that our student athletes understand that, um, you know, the, the gambling rules and, and uh, uh, educating them. But it's going to continue to be a problem, I think, as it becomes more and more prevalent. Um, and uh, um, I think just like, you know, the NCAA, quite frankly, has had to change some of its policies related to marijuana use because of the legalization of marijuana in so many states, they may have to look at how sports betting is being regulated too. Not that we ever want athletes betting <laughs> on sports that, that they're directly involved in, but um, should, a, should a student athlete be regulated differently than a normal student in their ability to, to bet on a professional golf match? Um, I guess that's a question that I certainly uh, think we're right on, but I don't know if that's going to continue to hold its spot. Yep, Susan? I promised you I wouldn't ask you a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. Every state is coming in. Um, can you talk a little bit about changes within our conference? And then, besides North Dakota State and South Dakota State, who do you think will uh, be the toughest opponent? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'll talk about our conference. Um, and, and so our league expanded um, a year ago and brought in Missouri State um, for, uh, for football. Um, which put us up to uh, 12. Um, so we redid our schedule, you know, for a two-year period, starting with this year. And then uh, this summer, uh, Western Illinois announced that they were leaving the Missouri Valley Conference and going to go to the Ohio Valley Conference. So now we're back to 11 again. And so we will have to redo the schedule for next year. Um, and uh, we'll go back to um, currently this year we will have three teams in the conference that we won't play. Uh, next year it'll be back to not playing two 
teams. I can't tell you who that is yet because we don't have a schedule yet uh, for 24. So um, it'll be back to what we have been uh, modeling. Um, you know, if you look at the, the rankings right now, Susan, besides South Dakota State and North Dakota State, um, uh, North Dakota has been, and they, they made the national playoffs last year. They're ranking right now in the top 15. Uh, Southern Illinois is off to a really good start. They look to have a really good team. Um, they beat Northern Illinois last week. Um, so uh, I would say right now, you know, probably based on early scores, uh, those two those two teams look to, to be pretty solid. Yep. Is, is being a football player these days practically a full-time job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, training cycles are, are year-round. Um, uh, I don't even know how many years ago now. It's been quite a few, probably six or seven. Uh, the NCAA allowed us to have uh, eight weeks of required activity uh, in the summer. And so our student athletes are here for eight weeks in the summer uh, where they do uh, training. Uh, there's some limitations on what you can do during those eight weeks. Uh, but uh, so our student athletes get a break after the season. Um, we have a, a weight uh, training cycle that picks up when the second semester picks up, and then we go into spring practice. Uh, they typically get about a month off at the end of the school year, and then we start our eight weeks up in uh, in June uh, for June and July, and then start a regular fall camp training schedule in August. So it really is a a full year commitment. Um, and honestly, all Division I sports are. It's not just football. Um, some don't have the required summer activity, um, but certainly expected summer activity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I agree. I mean, I, I don't think we're actually f very far from that right now with the way that schools are utilizing this NIL stuff. And, um, um, you know, I can envision <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that, that there may be and maybe it's not that far down the road that when a student si athlete signs a letter, a national letter of intent for a scholarship, that that becoming more of a contract that not only locks that student athlete into that school, but also carries a compensation level. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's a good thing, but it might be a way to get Get, her, get, the, get everybody's arms back around it and try to establish some level of, of equity. Um, you know, it's, the NCAA is in a really difficult position right now because anytime they try to make a rule, the first thing they have to look at is, are we going to get sued if we do this by antitrust legislation? And uh, I don't think that was ever, <laughs> when the NCAA was formed, that was ever thought of. And, but that's, that's what's happening right now. Yep. Uh, I just saw uh, Chip Kelly was talking about apparently there's a, they changed the rules about the uh, yeah. thing. Yeah. What was that all about? Yeah, so there was a, one major rule change, and I'm glad you brought this up. I was actually had this on my notes to talk about for those of you that are true football fans. So the NCAA changed a rule that no longer, except for the last two minutes of each half, no longer does the clock stop after a first down. The clock just continues to run. So it's now the same rule that the NFL has. And the reason that they did that is because they wanted college football to fit into a better television window. That's, no, I, actually, that's the reason. And so uh, over the first couple of weeks, uh, the research has shown that it's shortening the game by about six plays per team. So instead of running 70 plays now, you know, on average, teams are running 
mid-60s in terms of number of plays. And so that's what Chip Kelly's, Chip Kelly wants to run more plays and feels like we're making a rule that for college football that didn't need to be made because television wants more commercials. And, and I know, I mean, I feel it as a coach, I can't imagine what it's like for you as a fan, all these long television breaks that we even take. I can tell you if you go to an NFL game or you go to, if you were down at Missouri, it's even worse, uh, the length of those television timeouts. And so that's what's impacting the game, not the game itself. Especially when you like the momentum going and all of a sudden you get a timeout. Yeah. It just takes it away. Yeah. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come and speak. Uh, hopefully you can get to the game on Saturday and uh, see our guys play. Appreciate it. Thanks. Well, I'm glad I'm not a football coach. So many things to worry about. Wow, holy mackerel. So uh, uh, just a couple of things. One is if you